Well, like Mike mentioned, um, we get to kick off a new series today, and, and I'm so excited for this series. Before we even begin to talk about it, though, uh, they're not here today, but I just want to show some honor and love to Pastor Mike and Michelle. Make some noise for them. They, they've been amazing throughout this whole internship. I never get tired of saying it. They've, they've just, you know, embraced um, Mike Williams, myself, and our families, and they've loved on us like if we're their own. And, and you guys have loved on us, like, if, if, we're our, if we're your own. And it's been just so awesome to see how they spearhead this mission and vision that, that Metro Harvest has, not only to, to impact us here, but the, the communities around us. So uh, just make some noise for them again. They deserve all the love. They deserve all the honor. And it's, it's always great when they give me the opportunity to be up here. So we're kicking off this new series, and it's titled, What's Next? You see, here at, at Metro Harvest, we truly believe that you are somewhere in a spiritual journey, that you are somewhere in a spiritual continuum, and that you have a next step to take. That's the truth of it. Throughout the whole Bible, as early as Exodus 6 all the way to Revelation, we see God define this journey for us. And he defines it throughout the Bible in different ways, but essentially it's the same thing. So our goal for this series is to help you, help you identify where, where am I at in this journey? Where am I at in this spiritual continuum? And what is next for you? And I'd love to show you a verse, one of the many verses that inspired this series, Proverbs 29, 18. And we're going to read three different versions of it just so we can really, really understand it. Proverbs 29, 18, the King James Version says, Where there is no vision the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. The truth is, if we don't have vision, if if we don't have clarity to what we're pursuing, we're going to die. Maybe not physically, but emotionally, mentally, and even worse, spiritually. The NIV version says, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. And isn't that so true? When there is no clarity, when there is no revelation of what God wants us to do in our life, we can live pretty crazy lives. We can live lives where we don't know where we're going. Because we don't understand the vision that God has for us, we cast off restraints. We cast off our marriage. We cast off our emotions. We cast off our dreams. We cast off our goals. And we end up living a very, well, whatever comes next kind of life. And all that that brings is chaos. Now, I'd love to show you the uh, message version. Quick side note, this isn't a translation. This is a paraphrased version of Scripture. So it's not translated word for word. It is paraphrased so that we can get the idea of what Scripture was trying to tell us in a language and wording that we can understand today. It says, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. If you can't see what God is doing in your life, you won't know where you're going. You're going to stumble. You're going to fall. You're going to make a ton of mistakes. You're going to be aimless. You're going to be running around in circles. But it says when we attend to what he reveals, that's when we are most blessed. I really want us to understand this much, that some of us here today are settling for less than what Jesus died for. Some of us today are settling for less than what Jesus died for. You see, he paid the ultimate price on the cross. He paid the ultimate price on the cross for you and I to be most blessed, for you and I to live a full life. God has a plan for you. He's always made it clear in his word, like we mentioned, from from cover to cover, it is there. And I'd love to show you one of the instances where it's mentioned and for us to break it down together. Ephesians 1, 17 through 19, the NIV version says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. So that you may know him better. I pray 
that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. And I'll show you the the message version of this as well. It says, I ask the God of our master, Jesus Christ, the God of glory, to make you intelligent and discerning in knowing him personally, your eyes focused and clear so that you can see exactly what he, what, exactly what it is he is calling you to do and you can grasp the immensity of this glorious way of life he has for his followers. If you, just as we've read these, both of these uh, versions here of this same scripture, you're probably getting an idea of where it is we're going with this. But I'm going to present it to you in reverse, and I'll explain why. God wants you to have a glorious inheritance, a glorious way of life. God wants you to make a difference. God wants each and every one of us to make a difference. John 15, 8 and 11 says, This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Your joy can be complete. You can be most blessed. God's ultimate plan for each and every one of us is for us to live a life that makes a difference. But We can't live a life that makes a difference if we don't know where it is that we need to make a difference, right? And that's why we need to discover our purpose. It's only, only until after we've discovered our purpose, until we've learned what God wants us to do, that then we can make a difference. But we can't see what we're called to do tomorrow if we're still dealing with yesterday. We can't see what we're called to do tomorrow. We're still dealing with yesterday, and that's why we need to find freedom. Ephesians said that our eyes need to be focused, that our eyes need to be clear. You see, we all want to do something that matters, but a lot of times we we can't seem to, to stop dealing with yesterday, with addictions, with habits, with attitudes, with resentment, with unforgiveness, with anger, with mistakes of the past. Hear me out when I say this. Make this your year when you stop thinking about yesterday. Make this your year when you're no longer stuck with eyes not focused and clear. Make this the year where you're no longer defined by your addictions, by your habits. Wasn't it so encouraging for those of us who were here first Wednesday to hear everything that these people go through at Team Challenge, the past that they had, the yesterday that they were dealing with, but because they found freedom, they have found a calling, they have found a purpose, and now they're making a difference in the world? That's what God wants for each and every one of us. And we all know what it is we need to be free from. Because as we talk about this, it's coming to your head. It's coming to mind. You know that there's that one thing in your life that if it wasn't there, that one thing, your life would be so much better. But we can't make a difference until we discover our purpose. And we can't discover our purpose until we find freedom. But we can't do any of these things until we take the first step, and I'd say the most important step, and that is to know God. You see, knowing God in Scripture is defined as a very, very powerful thing. Some of us have probably never seen it this way, and and I'm going to explain it to you why it's such a powerful thing. Why, when Jesus spoke, the crowds marveled. When he spoke about knowing God, 
the odd and, and why Paul, when he, when he wrote to the first century church, why he mentioned knowing God and, and why they understood it the way he said it. You see, the word know that's used in Scripture to know God is actually a Greek word. And we'll throw it up here for you now. I cannot pronounce it in Greek, so I'm not going to. <laughs> but the, the, the way it sounds is gnosko. Gnosko, and that means to know God intimately. That's what Jesus, that's what Paul, that's what Scripture uses when talking about knowing God. And it's, again, it's not a, a know like, you know, I know Chris Pratt or I know Chris Evans and I know the guy who plays Captain America. Like, yeah, I know who they are because I've seen them on the, in the movies, but I don't know them personally. And that's where it kind of gets lost in translation with the English. But Jesus was using this word when he said, when he mentioned knowing God. It wasn't a knowing of, a superficial knowledge. It was an intimate relationship. This actually was a Jewish idiom that was used to describe a marriage, a marriage that was in the mo that was that had intimacy, the closest of relationships. It wasn't used in a sexual way at all. It was just used to explain and define the closeness that two people had. That's why when Jesus would say this, the crowds would gasp. They wouldn't understand it because up until that point, God was religion. God was tradition. God was distant. God was far away from them. So they couldn't understand the fact that Jesus was saying, we need to know God intimately. And then Jesus takes it a step further. Jesus says that this is the condition for eternal life. Matthew 7, verses 21 and 23, he says, not everyone, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We casted out demons in your name. We performed so many miracles in your name. But then Jesus says, I never, and there's that word again, knew you. Gnosko, I never knew you. God isn't looking for relationship. He is looking for a, God is not looking for religion. He is looking for a relationship with you. That's what he wants. He doesn't want pro prophesying, casting out demons and many miracles. He wants to get to know you. He's after your heart. That's what Jesus was trying to tell people. It doesn't matter the amount of things you do. I'll give you another example here just to make my case. Matthew 15. I love talking about the Pharisees because, man, they were, they were an interesting bunch, right? They thought they had it all figured out. Matthew 15. Jesus is, is con gets confronted by some of these Pharisees because they see Jesus and his disciples not following a hand-washing ceremony that they established. And so they tell Jesus, why do your disciples disobey our age-old tradition? You see, the way it was set up, it was, it was a lot. Just if you wanted to eat, if you wanted to get anything done, you had to clean your hands. And you couldn't just wash them the way we normally do. You couldn't let just all the water come out. You had to raise your hands up and let it run through your elbows. And if you did a little bit of it wrong, there was somebody there to call you out and pretty much send you to hell because you did a hand-washing ceremony wrong. And so they're so mad at that. And they say, for they ignore our tradition of ceremonial hand-washing before they eat. And so Jesus replies, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. For he wrote, these people honor me with their lips. And, you can, and we can put insert every other religious traditional type of activity. They honor me with their lips. They're here every Sunday. They pray the prayers. They sing the songs. They serve when needed. But, and there's the, there's the point we're trying to get to but their hearts 
are far from me. Their hearts are far from me. God is looking for intimacy with each and every one of us. This is what Christianity is all about. It's all about knowing God. And when we know God, we're in love with God. When we know God, we're in love with him. And there's, there's ways. There's ways to tell when we're not in love with God or when we've fallen out of love with God. Because we start to feel a sense of powerlessness. You see, because we don't know God, we don't know God's power. I, I think a lot about Matthew 8 and the centurion. And he goes to Jesus because his servant is not doing well. And he goes up to Jesus and he runs up to him and he says, Jesus, my servant needs healing. And then Jesus asked him, do you want me to go heal him? And the centurion says, no, 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 Jesus. I don't deserve for you to even set foot in my house. But I know you have the power to heal him right where you're at right now. You see, this man was also a man of authority. He had soldiers beneath him. He gave orders. So he knew what power and authority looks like. He knew Jesus. I'm always so fascinated, a total side note, because if, if I don't say it, I'm going to forget where I'm going with this. Um, I'm always so fascinated how former military men can tell other military people apart. Like, they see each other, and they just know, like, they, they have this presence. They, they command this authority, this power. Same thing here. This military guy knew the power and authority that Jesus had. He knew Jesus. And Jesus said, Jesus was marveled by it. He said, wow, I've never seen anyone with such a faith as yours. Go, he is healed. When you know God, you get God. When you know God, you get his power. You get the ability to overcome addictions, habits, attitudes, anger, resentment, unforgiveness. Some of us may feel like we don't know God or are not in love with God because we have a frustration with trying to do good. We read through the Bible. We, we go through it from front to end. And we try so hard to obey what it says, but it is hard for us. Well, of course it's going to be hard when you're not in love with God. Knowing God intimately, gnosko, implied relationship. I want us to think about knowing God in that same concept. It would be very hard for me to be in love, to, to be faithful in my relationship to my wife if I didn't love her, if I didn't even like her, it would be very hard. And a lot of times we make this mistake with God. The, we think that the solution is, I just need to obey harder. I, I can make the mistake of thinking, I just need to be faithful harder to God or to my wife. No, that's not the solution. The solution is, I need to fall in love again with my wife. A lot of us, it's not just about us obeying the Bible harder. No, we just need to fall in love with God more. Because Jesus himself said, his burden is light. His yoke is easy. When we fall in love with him, obeying what the Bible says no longer becomes harder. So the answer is not to try and obey harder. The answer is fall in love with God more. Some of us may even be feeling sort of envy and jealousy because we see others so close to God. We, we desire the, the closeness and the relationship that others have with God and that we don't. Or maybe at some point you knew God intimately and you were so in love with him, but you let that fire go out. And now I would just want to encourage you, it's time to get close to him again. It's time to have that intimate relationship with Jesus. So, 
Now we ask the big question. How? How do I do it? How do I get to know God? How do I get to know God the way Jesus says, the way Scripture says, and, and the most intimate way? The first, re- the first way we get to know Him is we love Him. We love Him because He loved us first. So many of us think that we need to get our act together before we can get to know God. That we, we need to, to deal with everything that we're dealing with right now before God will even care to turn our way. Let me, let me give you some freedom and some peace of mind. You don't need to get your act together to get to God. You need to get to God to get your act together. That's the way that it works, even with everything you've done. Even with everything he knows you're going to do, he loves you. He loved you first. He loved you so much that even before you could say yes to him, he died for you. Even before you had the opportunity to choose, he chose you. He died on the cross. He paid the ultimate price. I'm going to go on a little, another little tangent for you because I think this is very important and it needs to be said. If we love God, we also love his law. Just kind of reiterating what we were saying earlier. If we love God, we love his law. We love his word. And the reason I say this is because a lot of times, and, and this is happening a lot more recently, I won't, I won't name names because that's not important. What I will tell you is that there's this big mega church pastor who just went online in front of thousands of people. This guy fills out an event center. They bought an event center. And so all in front of all the people there, he was apologizing for God's law. He was saying, and, and talking about sexuality, he was saying, I don't know. I don't know why you are the way you are. If I was up there in heaven when God was creating people, I would have said, God, will you create a man, woman? Can you create a third box for like other? In front of thousands of people saying that, almost like an employee apologizing on behalf of the store and the manager for the, for the rules and then the processes that the store has. Saying, I'm sorry, I don't know. If it was up to me, I would do something so much different. But we have to obey God. And just kind of kicking his feet. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't If it was up to me, I'd be up there talking to him. If we love God, we love his laws that he's established in Scripture and that he's established in creation. And I have a promise for you. You will never hear things like that here at Metro Harvest. We will never be apologetic about spiritual truths. We will never apologize for what God has set in motion, for what God has set as order through Scripture and through creation. Because if we love God, we love his word, we love his law, and we love what he tells us to do and not to do. The second thing that we need to do if we want to get to know God is we need to pursue him with all of our heart. We need to pursue him with all of our heart because all relationships require this. All relationships require this. You see, a lot of us sometimes struggle to feel loved, to feel heard, to feel known by God. But if we, if we take a step back, if we're honest with, with, with ourselves and we take a step back and we're objective, we realize that we're not pursuing him. I'll give you an example of what pursuing looks like. And I'm the exception, not the norm here. I'll, I'll preface with this. I've been married six years now to my beautiful wife. She is amazing. When I knew I was in love with her, I pursued her. I pursued her with all of my heart. I'll give you a little glimpse into our our love story. She she, she tells it a lot better, but um, the moment I saw her, she went into an interview at my office where I was working at. The moment I saw her, I knew. I went up to my coworker and I said, I'm in love with that girl. And my co- yeah, my coworker did that. <laughs> yeah, he laughed. He laughed. And so then I planned this whole thing. 
um, I, you know, a bunch of us coworkers, we used to hang out all the time, and I'm like, hey, I want to get to know this girl, but I don't want to seem desperate, you know? So they're like, yeah, okay, we can do a cookout in my house. Someone offered, and they're like, yeah, yeah, sure, we'll do the cookout. I paid for all the meat, and it was expensive meat. It's like tomahawk <laughs> steaks and stuff, you know? And I paid for all, I wasn't saved back then, so I paid for all the beer, and I paid for everything. I, I set up this whole cookout, and then very casually, in a very nonchalant way, told um, Mel, I said, yeah, a bunch of us are getting together. I mean, you don't have to go. It's a small thing, but if you want to. And she's like, yeah, sure, I'll go. So I got her number there, and then I started texting her. And we talked all that night, and then I just kept calling her and texting her and then getting to know her and pursuing her. And then we finally, this happens January, and then we finally go on our first date, February 6, 2016. It was a Super Bowl Sunday. I didn't care for football, so we went to a nice restaurant. And we were sitting across from each other, and I knew I loved her so much, and I knew I wanted to pursue her that I told her I was going to marry her. On our first date, I told her. <laughs> I told her, I'm going to marry you. And she did that. She laughed. <laughs> she laughed in my face. Yeah. Who's laughing now, right? <laughs> but I pursued her. I pursued her. We met January, first date February. I asked her to be my girlfriend March. I proposed in November, and we got married in December. Yeah, I knew what I wanted. I loved her so much, and I pursued her with all my heart. But I'll paint another picture to you. How can, how can I expect my marriage of six years, or how could I ever expect, have ever expected that relationship to thrive and to succeed if I only made time for her once a week, even today? How can I expect to be in a great relationship with her if I'm only around and I only bother to talk to her once a week? How long do you think my relationship would last if I'm nowhere to be found until the trash needs to be taken out and she tells me to do it. How long do you think she would want to continue pursuing me if I don't pursue her? How can I think that, how can I invest zero time and energy into my relationship and then get mad when I don't feel loved by her? Do you see where I'm going with this? <laughs> How can we expect God to show up and show out if we don't even bother pursuing him passionately? If we only bother to show up some Sundays, if we only bother to pray when my back's hurting and my knees are cracking and like when something's wrong. How do, we, how do we expect God to show up and show out if we only show up when we're needed here and not to be in intimacy with him. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you will seek me and find me when, in other words, you have to do this, what's coming, in order to find me when you seek me with all your heart. When you seek me, when you pursue me with all your heart. I want to challenge you this year. It's May. We've got seven months to go. I had to do quick math there. Um, we've got seven months to go. I want to challenge you. You still have a lot of time. I want to challenge you to give us a year. From this month, May, to May of next year, give us a year of your life so that we can help you get to know God intimately. Give us a year and, and let us help you. Let us give you all the recommendations. Do starting point. Do life groups. Be here regularly. Be here first Wednesday. Be here every prayer meeting. Be here to serve. Give God your all. I promise you, your life will change. Your life will change. How many of us pursued God passionately and our lives changed forever? Show of hands. If you've been thinking about it, if you've been hesitant, look at all these hands. That's our Metro Harvest guarantee. <laughs> no. That's Jesus' guarantee. That's Jesus' guarantee. That if you seek him with all your heart, you will find him. And when you find him, your life will change forever. And I'll go one step further, and I, and I promise you, 
If you give us a year where you go all in, where you commit, where you love God, where you pursue him passionately, and nothing changes, not the slightest thing changes, I will leave this church with you. That's how confident I am. If you give us a year, your life will change so much. Pursue God through prayer, through reading his word. That's how we get to talk to him. But even more importantly, that's how we get to listen to what he has to say. When we pursue him through prayer, through scripture, through reading, through studying, through meditating on scripture, we can talk to him and we can hear what he has to say. We can hear where he wants to, where he wants to help us find freedom. We can hear where he's calling us to be or to go. And we can hear where he wants us to make a difference. The third and final thing is that we need to give him our life. You see, all relationships require commitment. All relationships require commitment. Again, when I fell in love, love at first sight, I pursued my wife so passionately, but I knew that I needed to commit. I knew that the next step that I needed and wanted to take was to make a commitment to spend and enjoy the rest of my life with her, for us to be together forever. This isn't about joining Metro Harvest at all. This is purely and solely about you giving your life to Jesus, whether that's here, whether that's there, whether that's anywhere. It's about giving your life to Jesus, to committing to him, to follow him, to pursue him, to love him, to serve him forever. If Let's read Luke 9, and I'll throw it up here. Because so many of us do this at times, where we get very confident in ourselves. We get very confident that we can figure it all out. We hang on to our lives and, and say that it's our own, and we, we decide what we do next, and we decide where we go next. But then Luke says, if you hang on to your life, you will lose it. If you hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, for Jesus' sake, you will save it. You want to save your life. You want to live a life full of joy, a most blessed life. You need to give it up. It, it goes against nature, right? <laughs> because we tend to lean more on our own understanding. We tend to lean more on what I can do. But then here comes Jesus and says, no, you need to give it up. You need to let me take control. And that's the only way that you will save it. We need to take that next step. We need to love God. We need to pursue him passionately. And we need to surrender our life to him. We can do that today. I also want to encourage you, if you've, if you've committed your life to Jesus already, then your next step should be baptism. Your next step should be baptism because, and I'll clarify, baptism is not a requirement for salvation. But a wedding wasn't, isn't, wasn't a requirement for me to get married to my wife. But I had a wedding because I wanted to show the world that she was my wife and that I was her husband. This wedding ring isn't a requirement for me to be married, but it's a public display every day that I am hers, and that she's mine, and that I'm committed to her forever. That's what baptism is. Baptism is that public display, you showing the world, I'm in love with Jesus. I'm pursuing Jesus, and I want to commit my life to Jesus. I've committed my life to Jesus. So I want to encourage you, take that next step if you haven't. Take the most important step, which is giving your life to Him. Don't wait another day. Don't wait another week. Don't wait another year. 
for years thinking that if you hang on to your life, that eventually you'll figure it out. I promise you, you won't figure it out. I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, right? But you won't figure it out. But I've got even better news for you. God, God will help you figure it out. If you give up your life to him, you'll be able to find freedom. You'll be able to discover your purpose. You'll be able to make a difference in other people's lives. That's, God, that's what God wants, ultimately. Let's pray. Jesus, we are grateful. We are grateful that you're such a loving God and that you love us so much and you know us so well because you're our creator that you've set before us the journey you want us to take so that we can live a life full of joy, a complete joy that's only found in you. So we ask that you help us this morning, that you help us see where we're at and see what next step we need to take so that we can please you, and so that we can live out this plan that you've set before us. As we continue to pray, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to do any of that. I am going to ask you to do this. If you've never taken that step of committing your life to Jesus, if you've never given him your life, this is your opportunity to do so. Again, no hands up, none of that. But after we pray this prayer that I want us to pray together, and we're all going to pray it because none of us pray here alone, I want you to commit to pursuing him. I want you to take a bold step of faith once service ends and see Pastor Larry, our starting point directors, by the cross. Because raising your hand when I ask if anybody wants to commit their life to Jesus, it won't do anything if you don't take that next step. So I'd much rather you do that after service ends, that you come up to the cross with our starting point directors, and you say, I'm ready to take my next step. I'm ready to know God intimately, and I want your help. So as we still have our heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want all of us to pray this prayer together. Say, Heavenly Father, I come before you today knowing that I can't do this on my own. Because if I continue to live my life the way that I'm living it, I will lose it. So today, I give up my life. I give it to you because I know you will save me. I ask that you forgive me for my sins. And I thank you for the price you paid on the cross. Because I was destined to death. But now I'm destined to life. Eternal life. And I could have never done it on my own. I can only do it through you. Thank you for new life. In Jesus' name we pray.